Charles II of England, also known as the Merry Monarch, had a truly legendary love life. His mistresses were visible integral members of his court, and stories of their affairs with the king, as well as their rivalries with each other, have echoed through the centuries. So, today we're going to take a look at Charles II, the king with a wilder love life than Henry VIII. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other royal scoundrels you would like to hear about. Okay, Charlie's Angels, here's your next mission. Born in 1630, Charles II spent much of his young adulthood in exile, but not because of anything he did. It's because of his father, who, as you probably guessed, was named Charles I. He was ousted from the throne and executed in 1649. When a puritanical regime ruled over England, Charles II bided his time hopping around Europe. Then, in 1661, England's parliament invited Charles to come home and become king, which is a hard offer to resist. This restoration of the monarchy ushered in a new phase in English history, and Charles certainly had some accomplishments during his 25 years on the throne. He was a patron of the arts and sciences, opening theaters in London and sponsoring the Royal Society for Scientific Study. But he's best remembered for a love life that would even make Henry VIII take notice. But whereas Henry's love life often turned deadly, watch the musical Six for more context, Charles II's was body. He was that type of man who never let a marriage get in the way of a good affair. A prolific adulterer, Charles freely engaged in colorful public liaisons with a string of women. These mistresses came from all kinds of backgrounds and were well known by courtiers and commoners alike. Through their relationship to the king, these women often found themselves at the center of court politics and managed to create more than a little intrigue of their own. Born into French nobility, Louise de Carouard first came to England in 1670 as part of Charles's sister's entourage. We don't know whether she was the turtle or the Johnny drama of the group, but we do know Charles quickly became infatuated with her and took her as his mistress. Like many of Charles's other lovers, Louise understood that her relationship with the king was ultimately political. In fact, she was a French spy and part of a direct line of information to King Louis XVI of France via the French ambassador. Even so, by all accounts, Charles was genuinely attached to Louise and admitted, "'Tis impossible to express the true passion and kindness I have for my dearest, dearest Fubs." Fubs, for the record, was his pet name for the foreign spy. It basically meant the same thing as chubby, and is said to have been an affectionate reference to her round baby face. Guess thick with two C's wasn't a term yet. Louise, for the record, stayed by Charles's side until his passing. That sounds romantic, but it might have merely been practical. She was a spy, so she may have been waiting just in case he blurted out one last useful bit of intelligence for the French, before kicking the royal bucket. Later in life, Louise attended the coronation of King George I, alongside Catherine Collier and Elizabeth Hamilton, all three of whom became duchesses, and all three of whom had acted as royal mistresses for the past 20 years. Boy, their tea times must have been dense with gossip. One of the best parts of being the King of England is that you can get an English person to take care of anything for you. And we do mean anything. Charles II, for example, had a dedicated servant for uh, procuring female company. The man who was officially in charge of Charles's bedroom was a man named William Chiffinch. But informally, everyone simply called him the Pimp Master General. No, seriously, that's a real thing. They really called him that. And he earned that title. Chiffinch recruited potential mistresses for Charles, from well-connected noblewomen to working-class walks of life in London. Hey, it was a dirty job, but someone had to do it, because the king said so. One of Charles's most controversial mistresses was Barbara Palmer, the Duchess of Cleveland. Uh, England, not Ohio. Nicknamed the Uncrowned Queen, and also known as the Duchess of Castlemaine, Palmer was not above throwing her weight around at court. And that was not the only thing she threw around at court. When Charles married Catherine of Braganza in 1662, Palmer busted out her undergarments at Whitehall Palace. According to historic royal palaces, this move demonstrated how Palmer, 
was not only objecting to the marriage, but making a claim of ownership over Charles and the court. Wait, is that how you bought things in Charles's England? Just go commando and walk away with a few palaces? The Merry Monarch indeed. Who hasn't fallen in love with some beautiful performer of the stage or screen? Well, when Charles II came to the throne in 1660, the theaters had been closed since 1642. Charles reopened them, and the revival brought something new to England. Professional actresses who had previously been banned from performing on stage. It seems like Charles was really into this idea because at least two of his mistresses were actresses. Performer Maul Davis took her attention from the king into considerable wealth, even earning a thousand pound a life pension from Charles after her work with him was done, which is around 225 grand in 2023 US dollars. But despite this lovely payout, it was another woman who would become a bit of a legend. Actress turned mistress Nell Gwynn won over king and kingdom alike with her plucky attitude, wit, and all-around good humor. Diarist Samuel Pepys even lovingly referred to her as Pretty Witty Nell, and he was a tough audience. Seriously, the dude saw Shakespeare's original production of Romeo and Juliet and A Midsummer's Night Dream and thought they were both complete crap. Hmm, wonder how he felt about the DiCaprio version. Commoners in particular celebrated Gwynn. To them, she was a bona fide celebrity, a woman of the people who climbed the ladder and didn't forget them. After a London crowd had mistaken her for another royal mistress, Louise de Carouille, a French Catholic, her response drew their cheers. Pray good people be civil. I am the Protestant whore. And that's how you write better than Shakespeare. Another story claims that Nell Gwynn went to extreme lengths to prevent Charles from seeing Mal Davis, the other acting mistress. Before Davis was supposed to have a rendezvous with the king, Gwynn added a laxative to Davis's meal, thus making her, um, indisposed for the remainder of the night. If FX is still making that feud show, we know what the next season should be about. In 1662, Charles married Catherine of Braganza, a Portuguese princess. The Queen Mother, and Charles's mother, loved Catherine, calling her the best creature in the world, from whom I have so much affection. I have the joy to see the king love her extremely. She is a saint. That's some high praise from your future mother-in-law. Unfortunately for Catherine and her new mom, Charles was already several years into an affair with Barbara Palmer, the Cleveland underwear lady. Charles was so devoted to Palmer that he once quipped, Whosoever I find to be my lady Castlemaine's enemy, I do promise upon my word to be his enemy so long as I live. And he meant it, even when it came to his queen. Yes, Charles expected his new wife to accept his affairs, and the couple entered into a marital fight that spilled over into the court. Charles ultimately won, he is the king after all, and appointed Palmer as a lady of the bedchamber to Catherine, blatantly ignoring the queen's fierce objections. Catherine was so scandalized when Palmer was presented to her that she passed out. But despite his frequent affairs, the failure to produce a legitimate heir, and the advice of others, Charles never attempted to divorce Catherine, or uh, get her out of the way. He definitely was not the kindest husband, but he was also no Hank VIII. Charles was in the habit of lavishing expensive gifts on his mistresses, being a rich king and all, which meant that being a royal mistress was quite the lucrative career. Barbara Palmer, for example, even had access to the privy purse, the private income collected and used by the British sovereign. Picture the opening of the Jetsons with Charles as George. Due to the power, wealth, and privilege that came with serving as a royal mistress, women often competed with each other to win Charles's attention and affection, which is probably what he had in mind the whole time like an old-timey reality show on Ye H1. The royal bed was undeniably a political space. As a result, some courtiers and officials tried to leverage power by making sure that the right woman had the king's ear. French ambassador Ralph Montague, for example, tried to install the Roman-born Hortense Mancini as the king's lover, with the aim of usurping reigning mistress Barbara Palmer. Palmer, in turn, consolidated her own influence over Charles by introducing him to other potential lovers that she could control. Whether by accident or design, Charles had the most powerful people in the country locked into an endless competition to find him the best lovers. 
and to think the rest of us are just stuck with dating apps. Speaking of Hortense Mancini, she was a niece of Cardinal Jules Mazarin, a member of the so-called Mazarinettes, the real name of the Cardinal's seven nieces, who we imagine also high kicked at Christmas. But in a twist worthy of a soap opera, Charles wasn't the only member of his family with whom she was getting it on. Mancini and Anne Leonard, Countess of Sussex, one of Charles's illegitimate children with Barbara Palmer, may have had their own affair. Predictably, it did not end well for the couple. When the teenage married Countess wanted to stay with Mancini rather than her husband, she was shipped off to a French convent. And the rest of the story is none of our business. Fathering an heir was a huge deal for a king, but Charles was not particularly effective in this area. Charles was married to Catherine of Braganza, but the marriage never produced any children, as Catherine had several pregnancies that ended in miscarriage. That string of tragedies must have been difficult enough for the queen, and we assume the fact that Charles managed to father somewhere in the vicinity of 16 illegitimate children with other women probably didn't make her feel any better. As for all those kids, Charles actually turned out to be a pretty solid dad, and he is said to have financially supported and doted upon them. But while they may have been cute kids, at the end of the day, they were still illegitimate and therefore ineligible for the crown. So when Charles died, his younger brother James succeeded him to the throne in 1685. Thankfully, there were never any scandals in the royal family again. So what do you think? Was Charles as trifling a womanizer as Henry VIII? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.